Welcome to worship. I'm so glad you could join us today. Today we're continuing our journey with Micah 6a. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. Today we're going to explore what it means to do justice. May God bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that we may live from deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of God's creations so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless us with just enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in the world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all our children and all our neighbors who are poor. Amen. With what should I approach the Lord and bed down before God on high? Should I come before God with entirely burned offerings, with year-old calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with many torrents of oil? Should I give my oldest child for my crime, the fruit of my body for the sin of my spirit? God has told you, human one, what is good and what the Lord requires from you to do justice. Embrace faithful love and walk humbly with your God. The voice of the Lord calls out to the city. Wisdom appears when one fears your name. Hear, tribe, and who appointed her? Are the treasures of wickedness still in the house of wickedness while the shorted basket is denounced? Can I prove wicked scales in a bag of false ways in a city whose wealthy are full of violence and whose inhabitants speak falsehood? and lying tongues in their mouth. So I have made you sick by striking you. I have struck you because of your sins. You devour, but you are not satisfied. A gnawing emptiness is within you. You put something aside, but you don't keep it safe. That which you do try to keep safe, I will give to the sword. You sow, but you don't gather. You tread down olives, but you don't anoint with oil. You tread grapes, but you don't drink wine. Yet you have kept the policies of Omri, all the practices of the house of Ahab. You have followed their counsels. Therefore, I will make you a sign of destruction. Your inhabitants an object of hissing. You must bear the reproach of my people.
Lord require of you, but to do justice. To do justice. What do you think of when you hear that word, to do justice? Do you picture a scene from Law and Order? In your head, do you picture Atticus Finch standing up to defend the black man against false charges from the white people in To Kill a Mockingbird? When you think of the word justice, do you picture crowds of protesters with their arms raised shouting, no justice, no peace, as they demand that police officers be held accountable for shooting unarmed black people? What do you think of when you think of the word justice? In the Hebrew scriptures, the word justice has three different words that are used with it. One of the words means abiding by the law, one of the words means righteousness, and one of the words means judgment. The word in our text today is the word mishpat, which means judgment. But when we think about this word, we need to realize that that word justice has all sorts of implications. In our society, we think of justice and we put ourselves in the criminal justice system where we think about courts and trials, where we think about police officers and prosecutors, where we think about criminals, and we think about the judgment that they receive for the acts that they have committed. But in the Hebrew scriptures, when we think about judgment, and justice. Justice is a vision of how and what life should be. It's not just a vision of how to do things, abiding by the law, but it's a vision of what can be and what will be and what should be if we follow our obligations. In the Hebrew scriptures, this idea of justice grows out of the idea of covenant. That within the faith tradition, God and the people of Israel made a covenant to each other where the Israelites agreed to live under the protection, the love of God. And in that, they were obligated to God. And those obligations turned into a set of rules and laws to abide by and follow. But there was also an obligation that was placed on them to how they were to think about the vulnerable and the poor. To think about those in the Hebrew scriptures that are listed as the people that we are always to consider whenever we are doing something. The stranger, the non-Israelite, the immigrant, the widow, the orphan, the poor. That when we think about our obligations, we are to consider our impact upon the vulnerable. And that's why in today's scripture, I read this section to you after the phrase that we're working on, to do justice. Because I wanted you to see what the judgment of God was about. What was it that the prophet was angry about with the people? What was it that the prophet was calling the people to change? And in that section of scripture that follows, what we hear is sins against God. And these sins are, one, the wealthy are full of violence. That our community is full of lies. That you, the people I'm talking to, devour and aren't satisfied. You sow, but you don't gather. You tread on olives, but you don't anoint. You tread grapes, but you don't drink. You follow the wrong king and the wrong laws. In other words, the prophet has looked around at the society and said that this justice, 
This obligation we have to God is not working out the way that God has told us it's to work. That the wealthy are using their power with violence instead of seeing their obligation to the poor. They are devouring and aren't satisfied. And there's so much lies going on. I mean, think about when they say things about sowing and gathering olives and anointing grapes and drinking. Some of those are ritual acts that may be part of what is being discussed here is that this judgment brought by the prophet is to the religious folk, the religious hierarchy, who has been practicing the faith, but the prophet wants to call them back to a deeper and realer faith, a faith that takes those obligations, those judgments, that God has given us that law-abiding nature and changes it and makes it real so it's a vision of what humanity should be, that we're living into the age of how we should do things in a way that reflects God's desire. And so they aren't taking those olives and creating the oil that they use to anoint, to heal people. They're taking those olives and devouring them, selling them. So how do we deal with this idea of to do justice in our context? What does it look like? What does it mean for us? What are our obligations to God? And while I was thinking about this scripture, I came across a video by one of my favorite rabbis, Danya Rudderberg. And in it, she described how justice is different in the Jewish tradition. Because justice asks this question, if we were to think about hunger and what we do about it, one of our obligations is to help hungry people eat, so to give funds and to provide food for those who are hungry. But the justice side of that obligation asks a different question. It asks questions about why people are hungry. And so she shows these three pictures to help you understand it more fully. She says, equality means that if you are looking into the baseball field, so you're down at Wrigley Field and you're looking over the fence, equality would mean that you give the same size box to the three people standing there. But those three people, one is really tall, one is medium, and one is very short. So if they stand on equal size boxes, they will all be at the same height they originally were, and some of them still will not be able to see over the fence to watch the Cubs play. So then she says, the next idea is equity. So what they do is they build boxes that make everybody the same height. So the tallest person doesn't get a box because they can already see over the fence. The middle person gets a box that makes them as tall as the tallest person. And the shortest person receives a box that makes them as tall as the tallest person. So the equity makes them all the same height and now able to see over the fence and watch the Cubs play. But justice, justice takes down the wall. Justice gets rid of the fence. Justice asks us why there was a fence there in the first place and gets rid of that fence. Justice makes it so that if you see the three people being able to be present without a fence in place. So what does that look like in our real life? to talk about why. Why justice? What does it look like to practice justice? What does it mean to ask the question why and dismantle something? So I want you to take one of the statistics about COVID-19. One in 1,000 black Americans 
have died from COVID-19. If we're practicing justice, if we're doing justice, we ask the question, why? Why is one in 1,000 Black Americans dying from COVID-19? And there are going to be a lot of reasons and answers to that question. A lot of things that need to be changed so that one in 1,000 Black Americans don't die from COVID-19. What are those questions and things that we need to look at? We need to look at what kind of jobs are available to Black Americans. Does it mean that they are in the jobs that make them most vulnerable to getting COVID-19? Do we ask questions about what kind of neighborhoods they live in that we have created that are segregated and the systems that are put in place in those neighborhoods that make healthcare much more difficult? When we see studies that show when a black person goes into a hospital, the treatment they receive is very different from what a white person receives and their outcomes are much worse. When we see that with health care, they may or may not have insurance because their jobs do not provide the insurance coverage. And so they are more likely to go to the hospital when they are at a sicker phase and when you are sicker with the virus, your outcome is more likely to lead to poor outcomes. And if your treatment is different than when you get there, your outcomes also are worse. And what we see is that we have communities where there may not be hospitals that are available to them. They may not have the money to go to the hospital and think about how much it will cost. And so they put off going to a hospital. That the healthcare system is structured in such a way to keep them from the care that would help them in an earlier phase. And then we look at the things that lead to the co comorbidities that lead to death. So in those communities, there are desert, food deserts, in which they can't find or don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. That the food choices they have are designed in a way that make it worse for our bodies. So when we ask the question, why? Do one in 1,000 Black Americans die? We have to talk about structural racism, structural segregation. We have to talk about the healthcare system, the economic system. We have to talk about all these issues that have to be changed and transformed so the wall is gone. To do justice, to do justice, to ask that why question. To ask the why question is hard. To do justice is hard. It takes work, it is difficult, but it is necessary. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice. To create a world where everyone is seen as a beloved child of God created in God's image where everyone, the poor, the widow, the orphan, the stranger, is included in our community. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice.
As we settle into prayer today, I invite you to close your eyes, to breathe in deeply, and to release your breath. I invite you to breathe in and let go. I invite you to breathe in, breathe in justice, and breathe out love. Justice, love. May justice flow down like water. God, may justice flow down where there are people that don't have enough food, where there are people without money, where there are people without work, where there are people without a home, where there are people without health care, where there are people treated differently because of their gender, their race, their class, their sexuality, their ethnicity, their politics. May justice flow down like water. God, make us courageous to live boldly into your kingdom, to serve our neighbors, to love our enemies, to welcome the stranger, to bring justice, peace, and wholeness. God, we stop now to pray for those on our hearts, those who are ill, those who are lost and anxious, our family and our friends, may they be happy, may they be well, may they be safe. And God, this week we ask that justice flow down like water as our country is in the midst of an election season that has caused all sorts of divisions. We ask you to surround those of us, to surround all of us as we vote. May you guide and direct us. May you lead us. May justice flow down like water. Hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, with these gifts to our neighbors in need, organizations will receive grant funding, communities will be strengthened, and our neighbors will experience love without judgment. Bless these gifts that they may be used to share your justice with the world. 
Amen. And if nobody told you today that I love you, remember that God loves you and always will, that Jesus loves you and always will, that I love you and always will. And may you do justice, act with kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Amen.